make sure you check out our online store where we work with our graphic designer to create stunning garment and product designs that feature a wide variety of aircraft types such as British fighters, World War II aircraft, American bombers, Russian fighters and much more. You can pick your favourite designs and personalise any items within our Redbubble store that range from clothing right the way through to stationery. All of our designs feature our logo so you can show your support for the channel while getting a quality product. You can head to our website aircrewinterview.tv and click store or go to redbubble.com forward slash people forward slash AC interview. Thank you and enjoy. What were your first sure. thoughts when you saw up the clothes? <laughs> Do you want the honest answer? Go on, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get too vulgar, but when I first looked at it on the flight line, my first thought was, my God, there's no way that thing could fit on an aircraft carrier. <laughs> Followed immediately by, it kind of looks like a, a penis with a hat on. Like, it's a very funny looking plane. Like, there's nothing about it. And now you'll never not be able to see that, by the way. Oh, so I'm going to say that now. Yeah, cheers for that. A hundred percent. It, But it's a weird looking plane. And it wasn't until I got into the training and I really understood why things were the way they were that it that it made sense. But I mean, from an aircraft standpoint, it doesn't, I mean, you have two big engines, a huge wingspan, four tails, but only three of them are a rudder. I mean, it's just bizarre <laughs> the way they put this thing together. Um, but it all makes sense once you understand the history behind it and, and why it is the way it is. So, um, but I would say first thought definitely was, holy hell, that thing is huge. I, I don't, and that was, they were all parked on the flight line and, and the wings were all folded. So I could only imagine with the wing spread, how big it was. And it's not a small plane when you're trying to put it down on a small aircraft carrier. So absolutely. It was, yeah, it was it's a, a big old lady, <laughs> but uh, can, you, can you talk us through some of your ground training in the E2? Sure. So uh, initially start up, you know, I've gotten my wings, I've carrier qualified in the T-45. So I've proven that I could at least do it 10 times without killing myself <laughs> and off to the E-2. Um, you go in on day one and uh, you, they put you in a room. I'll never forget it. There was 10 of us, 10 students, uh, pilots and instructors came in and they explained how the E-2 and the C-2, because they're, they're very similar in their avionics and things like that, um, that you would never see a civilian variant. And right. I was like, you know, from a from an E2 standpoint, I'm like, well, obviously, why would there be a civilian E2? Like, there's no need for that. Mm -hmm. But what they got at is the reason there wouldn't be is because our FAA, which is now it's changed since, but our FAA had deemed the instrument scan so bad that it was unflyable, the wow. way they had the original steam gauges all right. outlined, and that it was aerodynamically unstable, <laughs> the airframe was. And I was like, okay, maybe I picked the, maybe I should have went helicopters. I don't know. Um, but then they basically said, okay, there's 10 of you. Two of you are going to go fly the C2. Eight of you are going to go fly the E2. We've never had a class not figure it out amongst themselves. So figure it out. You have all day. See ya. And they all walked out. And it was just the 10 of us in there. And we wow. had to figure out who was going to do what. Um, so that was day one. Um and it, it got interesting in that room for sure because there were some people that did not want to fly the E2. They were offering money for a C2 slot. Um, I kind of took myself out of it very quickly because I wanted to fly the E2 because secretly in the back of my head, I always still wanted to try to fly fighters. And I figure if I flew the E2, I'd be day qualified, night qualified behind the ship. I'd be around the air wing, kind of a poor man's uh, networking opportunity. Um, whereas the COD guys are kind of off on their own doing their thing. Um, so I picked right off the bat. I was like, I'll take an E2 slot and I was done. So, um, but then it was simulator training in a very rudimentary simulator. Frankly, um, they rarely even turned the motion on, um, because the motion was hydraulically operated and it kind of lagged the computers. So most of our simulator training was, was procedural by nature. And then you were right into into flying that plane, which is grossly different than coming from a little T-45, which was a blast of a little jet to fly, to now into this huge plane that uh, has massive amounts of P-factor and all this stuff that you don't even really know what that is at that point. Um, so to say it was a fire hose of training is is putting it lightly. It was a lot of, it was a lot of work. Absolutely. But, and yeah, you mentioned the crews before, but can you can you tell our viewers how many crew uh, crews were on board? And yeah, basically what the roles of each guy, girl was on there on board. 
Sure. So you have a pilot, co-pilot, um, and they're they're pretty much interchangeable. Um, you know, one sits in the left, one sits in the right. Now in the Navy, we fly the person physically flying the plane for takeoff and landing is the left seat pilot um, because of where the lens is on the ship and things like that. Not to say you couldn't land it from the right seat. Um, it would be difficult at the ship because your scan would be horrible. Um, but that was basically what you did. It didn't, the seat up front didn't really delineate who was more senior or who wasn't. There was times, you know, when I became an aircraft commander, I'd be in the left seat. Sometimes I'd be in the right seat. It just depended on the flight and who needed the landings and all that. And then in the back, you have three Naval flight officers. Um, we called them the RO, the ACO and the, the SECO. And the, the RO is the person who sat the furthest forward. Um, RO is radar operator. And basically their job was to get the radar systems up and online. I mean, they all kind of worked interchangeably, but mm -hmm. typically the RO is the most junior back person in the back um, just working the systems because that was a full-time job just to keep those radars working and, and all the other systems. Uh, the ACO, the, the air control officer, was the furthest back, uh, which I always said was, was the worst seat to sit in because you're at the tail of the whip back there. Um, and they were the primary air-to-air -air controller, typically. Again, anybody could have done it because they each had a scope. Um, and then the SECO was the mission commander in the middle and would usually work kind of everything. So from a seniority standpoint, for the most part, it was most junior was the forward, most uh, senior was the middle, and then the middle was the was the aft person working that. So uh, small tube, three scopes, um, just like you see in the Top Gun movie, and uh, that was 100% accurate. I, I literally, that scene, although it was brief, gave me chills because of how <laughs> accurate the calls were, everything. I mean, it was it was done really well, and it was it was cool to see to see some homage paid to an aircraft that most people don't know about. So it was kind of interesting. I'm going to have to ask this one, one back before we move on. Was there an oven in there? <laughs> no oven. Although some of the, which is totally unhealthy, but some of the boxes were so hot you could warm things on them because they would just run at such a high, hot temperature. Right. Um, and then even like things like the windshield heat and stuff, you could put stuff in there. Uh, sometimes when we were lucky on the ship, we would get like cans of soda and you would bring one and if you put it on the window, you could chill it. I mean, there were things you could do. You, you've, you learn every trick, but there was, the plane was not, and nor is it still really designed with air crew comfort in mind. Um, the E2D is when they're now doing in-flight refueling. So they didn't, they didn't have a thought of, you know, you basically had six and a half hours of gas and that was it. So, you know, in the Navy's fashion, they're like, they could do anything for six and a half hours. So the seats were very uncomfortable. Um, they, the, the cockpit itself was not comfortable for the most part. I mean, I'm not a small person, but it wasn't very comfortable. And then, you know, there was no amenities. Uh, there were relief tubes underneath the pilot seats and one common relief tube in the far back of the airplane for for the back uh, NFOs. So it was it was very much a war fighting, if you want to call it that machine. And, and the Navy didn't didn't care. I joke that if the Air Force had made an E2, it probably would have had an oven and like a cot, <laughs> um, you know, a cappuccino machine. There would have been a lot nicer things in there, but no, not for the Navy at all. 